amazing sport. Uh, she, she got on some podcasts because this was kind of her like, moment of social media fame, right? And, and people were asking her, like, is, is the NFL paying you to do this? You know, are, are you just an actress that was, she's like, no, this is me every game. I live and die with every play, and they just happened to put me on TV for the first time this last weekend. Now, here's what I know about her, that at the end of that game, when the Chargers lost, there was no finding peace for her, right? And that's the reality. If you're a sports fan, you probably get that. But the challenge for her there is that the emotional highs and lows that she will experience all depends upon the circumstances and the outcome of the game. And maybe you even experience the same thing sometimes as a, as a sports fan, where if your team and you are a big fan, um, you know the next day, if you win the next day, you're going to be in a pretty good mood. If you don't win, that the next day might be a little bit rough. In fact, maybe you have some family members that just know to give you some space for the next hour or two after the game, right? And that's, that's the reality there of what happens in one slice of our lives when everything, your emotional highs and lows are totally dependent upon the outcome of which way something goes. The most incredible thing though that that Paul, the character we're going to take a look at here today, Paul had, had built and experienced in his faith life something that I believe is incredibly helpful for you and incredibly helpful for me as we talk about this, this topic of peace of mind. Because what Paul speaks about is how to experience the peace of God. How to experience the peace of God that transcends all human understanding that is not tied to your circumstances, whether something goes the way that you want or the way that it doesn't. And, and Paul experienced that same thing, highs and lows in many different ways. And what I admire so much and, and I think that we can learn from here today is that in the high times, and he had some incredible experiences in his life, but also in the lows, he learned the secret of finding peace in the middle of both of those. So if you've got a, a Bible with you here today and you want to follow along on your own, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, I'll walk you through this passage on the screen here as well. Uh, but in Philippians 4, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Uh, it's a church plant that he started a number of years ago. Loves these people. These are his friends. And he is now writing to them to encourage them a number of years later. And Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then he says this, and the peace of God, say it with me, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says, as you pray and as you learn how to deal with, with what you're anxious about, um, as you present your request to God with thanksgiving, he said you have the opportunity to also experience the, the peace of God in some really unique ways in your life that God might help to guard and keep your, your heart and your mind. And he goes on to say this. He says, don't be, uh, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, he said, focus on, on these things. Focus on things that are, are positive and will bring you hope. And, and whatever you have seen in my life over time, Paul says, whatever you've learned, received, or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and then say it with me and the... God of peace will be with you. What Paul is praying for, for his friends and for that church, is that they will experience God's peace in their life. And what I am praying for you and our team is praying for you as a church and as God's people, and some of you might be fairly new to faith and exploring some of this, we're praying that you will experience that very thing, that you'll discover the peace of God 
um, is a gift in some incredible ways in your life. So, uh, I want to challenge you personally to think about what this might mean for you. So, uh, let me ask all of you, uh, have you experienced anything in the last year that has caused stress in your life? <laughs> Yes. Um, the reality is this. Some of you might be dealing with something that is really significant or big, maybe even in this moment right now. But the truth is all of us have things. It might be something that pops up every once in a while. It's like, man, when this happens, I tend to get stressed or when this is going on. Um, I want you to, to think about an area where you experience stress in your life and then ask that, that question would you like to be able to take that place where the circumstances you're dealing with, the worries, the stress that you are up against, would you love to exchange worry for peace in that place in your life? I think in many ways that can be such a, a gift. And sometimes you might even have a well-meaning friend that comes up to you and says, they know you're going through some stuff, and they say, hey, I just, man, I want to encourage you, been praying for you. Um, Hey, why don't you, I just think if you just prayed about this and you gave it to God that, and, and just stop worrying about it, you'd have a lot more peace in your life. And maybe you've had a conversation like that with a, a friend and you kind of think in your head, you may or may not say it there, to say, look, you have no idea what I'm going through right now. And maybe you say to that friend there, you think to yourself, look, they've led a pretty charmed life. They've not dealt with much. It's easy for you to say, why don't you just find peace and be able to do that? And, and, and yet there's a difference when it's someone there that, that maybe you think hasn't dealt with a lot of adversity, hasn't gone through many things in their life and are, are just being very optimistic and saying, this should just be easy for you. Trust God and you won't worry about this anymore. It's different when you have a friend of yours that's, say, been in the hospital for a couple of weeks, or a friend of yours that might be dealing with a terminal illness, or someone that's gone through some other adversity in their life, and that friend reaches out to you and says, hey, man, you know some of the things that I've walked through but, but I just want to encourage you. There's some things that God has been teaching me in this last season in my life. There are some things here where man, I've actually learned how to find happiness and how to find peace and contentment in some ways that I never would have expected. And man, if you want me to share that with you, I'd be happy to, to share what it's been like to find that even with some of the things that I've gone through. A conversation like that with a friend is a little bit different, isn't it? Because it flows from a place where you know this is not just cheap platitudes. This is not just something that's a kind of a Pollyanna or optimistic approach. Um, that it flows from a place where God has really done something in their life. And, and the cool thing is this. Paul, when he is writing to the Philippian church, it is a book that talks a lot about happiness and joy and experiencing peace and and yet, you want to know where he was writing this book from? He was writing it from prison because he had been thrown in jail because of some of the opposition that he dealt with in his ministry. And so, as his friends received this letter from him talking about rejoicing in the Lord and finding that kind of happiness in him and experiencing God's peace, they knew some of the things that he had gone through in his life. In fact, let me just share with you the, some of the backdrop for Paul, uh, some of the stress events that he went through. And this list of things is actually from a different book from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he was talking about just kind of his leadership and calling and, and, and shared with that church there, look, these are all the things that, that I've endured and walked through for the sake of the gospel. He's talked about being thrown in prison over and over, almost died several times, five times was, was severely whipped, 40 lashes minus one, which was a, a punishment that was given out that sometimes was so severe that might even cost you your life. It's what happened to Jesus, that 40 minus one, 39 lashes, as he was whipped before he he went to the cross. Uh, Paul says that 
He was beaten three times with rod, pelted with stones, three times with shipwrecked, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger with Jews, in danger with Gentiles, constantly on the move, worked hard, gone without sleep, been hungry, thirsty, naked, and cold. And these friends knew his story and many of the things that he had walked through in his life. And against all of that list of things, Paul says, let me talk to you about how to be really happy and find joy. <laughs> I mean, verse 7 from the, the Living Bible, it says it this way. It says, man, if you do this, it said you're going to experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than any human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you say it with me, trust in Christ Jesus. What he said there was, look, as you trust in Christ Jesus, peace is possible for you. And he said that, that, look, pray about what you want, but Paul understood this, that, look, you can pray for and hope for your circumstances to change or God to come through or something to, be, to, to shift in your life, but the reality is this. Paul said the the way that you can find peace, even when those things are not changed or taken away. He said, you can find peace. He said, because I have found this peace. I've discovered how God does this in the midst, not only of the highs, but also in the lows of life. So I wanna share with you here today four, four steps, four ways here from Paul and break apart this passage uh, a little bit um, look in Philippians chapter 4 at some of the different things that Paul says, look, why don't you lean into this and this and these things um, in the pursuit of peace, in finding peace in your life. And so the first thing that as you go back through this passage, starting there at first vor, um, is to let go of your worries, to let go of the things that, that give you anxiety or give you worry and Paul says this, uh, taking a look at that passage, he says, always be full of the joy, joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. And he said, don't worry about anything, which is sometimes easier said than done, correct? And, uh, and yet Paul said, look, by trusting in Jesus, there are some ways, how can you help to give some of those worries and place them into God's hands to be able to, instead of, instead of obsessing about things that you can't control or things that you can't change, what if you took some of those worries, instead of worrying about that, you allowed the one who actually can change things to, to worry about those things. And, and I've, had conversations with, with people through the years, and there have been times where, where people have said to me, um, hey, I find myself right now, I've got a, you know, a son or daughter that's going through a really big medical thing, and I don't know how to fix it, or I'm walking through some other kind of challenge in my life, and I find myself just waking up at, at midnight or at four in the morning, and and I'm just not quite sure what to do, but my mind is racing with the things that I'm worried about and what that means. And my encouragement has been there to say, look, those, those moments can be an opportunity to say, all right, it, it's, not a, it's not a sin to be anxious or to, to feel the, the weight of some concern or something that is going on in your life. But I think those moments there, man, that can be a chance for you to, to move to pray. That, that sometimes anxiety can be a signal for you in your life to say, how do you need some help? Or how do you pray about this? How do you reach out to God? And, and I read a, a book there once that talked about like those late night moments or early morning moments where you, you wake up and something is on your mind, you're dealing with that. It's almost like a, a yellow light on your car's dashboard. Um, that it's not flashing red, but it's, a, but it's just something there that says, hey, this is something to, to pay attention to. And what Paul says is instead of worrying and getting stuck in that place, he said, instead, let me tell you how to unload some of those worries. And you can do that through prayer. Number two is this, it's to pray about, 
about what you need, and also to do that with thanksgiving, to do that with a, a posture of thankfulness, to also pray with thanks for what God is doing in your life, even if, if there are other circumstances or things that you are praying over. Uh, Paul says this, verse 6, he says, But in every situation, let God know what you need in prayers and requests while giving thanks. And, and I think about what that's like, uh, what a, a privilege that is to be able to go to God in prayer personally, but even times there for you, um, it may be with some friends or maybe with a spouse or with somebody else to be able to say, hey, let's pray about that. And to have somebody pray for you or with you can be such an incredible gift. On our Alpha retreat going into this weekend from Friday to Saturday, we had the, the opportunity to be able to pause and pray for, um, for a lot of people, anybody that wanted to receive prayer. And that is a, it was a, just a wonderful opportunity there to be able to pray over some people. Um, and for some of them, it was a, a question of, of faith, taking a step of faith and wanting to experience God's presence and their lives. For some, it was an answer for prayer, something healing, something going on emotionally or physically in their life. A um, whole variety of different ways, but, but at the end of that time, there's one of the young adults that, as I was getting ready to leave and head back to campus for worship yesterday, one of those young adults there that just gave me a huge hug and, and thanked thanked our team for what this was doing in her life and how she's seeing God in some new ways and how she's experiencing that. Um, there's something powerful in prayer that shifts it be from a place where it's just what you are walking through to what, what God has the ability to do. And in fact, there are moments and there are times where, where sometimes during the course of the month, we try to plan for that at least once a month here with our church where we have an opportunity for people to come and receive prayer. Uh, we're going to do that at the end of the service today. So you may have something that is causing you stress or worry in your life. Um, why don't you come forward today at the end of worship and allow somebody to pray for you and, and allow God to do the work in your life, some things that only he can do. Um, it says this, it says, then God's peace, which goes beyond anything that we can imagine, will guard your thoughts and your emotions through Christ Jesus. I've read this passage uh, any number of times through the years and, and thinking about ways that I've highlighted this and marked this up and this has been helpful for other people and it's been helpful for me. There's that phrase though, uh, that God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and and I found myself thinking about that phrase as we were preparing for this series, uh, peace of mind. What does that mean for God to, to guard your heart and mind? And I found it interesting when I look back into how that, that word or the context in that time period, when you talk about guarding something, um, very closely connected to the, um, to the Roman guards and to those that were in authority at that time. Uh, the Jewish nation, the people was at that time occupied by the Roman Empire. And so you had the, the Roman guards that often would be deployed to guard something to do this. And this picture of to guarding something is almost the picture of guarding the gate. And you can see this picture here that uh, obviously a reenactment. Um, you know, we didn't have a time machine to go back and get that picture and come back for you here. But uh, a reenactment there of, of how you'd have these large open gates of, uh, in many different cities, in many different places, where you might have the Roman legion or some guards that were deployed uh, to even fill an entrance. Or sometimes you might have a couple of them that would carry their weapons and pace back and forth in the middle of where that opening is. And the idea is there with a show of force is that if you put the Roman guards in front of the gate, that nobody's going to get through, right? And, and in fact, this is what happened. This is the idea of what happened even when Jesus gave his life and died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb. What did the Jewish leaders go to Pontius Pilate to ask for? They said, put a couple of guards in place. Why? Guard the tomb. 
so that it's untouchable, so that nobody will get through. Nobody can go mess with Jesus' body. And, and I love this picture there of how God will help to guard your heart and mind um, as you give your worries to him, as you pray over these things. Um, in some ways, this picture there is God says, let me help to guard for you the amount of things that you let in. Give some of those things to me so that your mind is just not filled with them all the time. Uh, because would you agree that so many of the things that we worry about in life never even come to pass, yes? And that's the crazy thing about worry and why it is so counterproductive is that many of the things that we worry about never even take place. Uh, in fact, Penn, uh, Penn University um, did a study, did a research project, and they, they asked people, they did a kind of a, a short longitudinal study, and they said, all right, we want to document for everybody in that study, what are you worried that's going to happen? What are some worries or fears that you have? And they said, document all those, write all those down, and then they had them track over the course of the next month, one month out, 30 days later, how many of those worries actually came true? You want to know what the percentage was? 9%, which means that 91% at Penn State in that study, 91% of the things that people worried about never even happened. But yet how much energy do you think was burned worrying about those things? It, it's why it is such a gift when God says, look, let me help to guard your mind um, by allowing me to deal with some of the stuff, and especially as one who holds the future, the one who actually can deal with what might happen or not happen in your life. I love this, this quote by Pastor Craig Groeschel, who kind of identified the difference between how do you filter concerns in your life and how do you filter worries in your life? And I found this really helpful that concern focuses on challenges and moves you to action. That concern, actually, there are times in your life and with your family or things going on there that it's wise to be concerned and to say, how do you respond to that? How do you do something with that? I'll just give you one example. Imagine that you are taking care of a, you know, one of your young kids and you've got like a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Say it's your kid or it's your grandkid and you're out kind of walking through the neighborhood and you're on the sidewalk and all of a sudden they get distracted and they run right out into the street. When your kid is out there in the street and you see a car coming, what's your next move? That's right. You know, it's just to stop and pray and ask that God will make them turn around. No, it, you, what you, you go out there, you put your hand out there, you're like, man, try to get attention to the car and just run and scoop up your kid and you get out of the way. Again, concern moves you to action and and yet worry on the other side, as he shared about that, that worry focuses on what's beyond your control and results in inaction. Um, that worry, um, in many ways, allows you to get stuck in things that you really can't control and leads you to a place of, of inaction in your life. And it's why God says, why don't you give me the worries? Pray about what you need, what you're looking for, Again, take action, lean in, uh, be proactive in your life, walk by faith in lots of good ways. But God says the secret to finding peace in many ways is to learning to recognize those things that are beyond your control and trusting those things in God's hands. Number three is this, to focus your mind on positive things. What Paul does here is brilliant uh, because if you have... If you've ever had something that you were worrying about and really obsessing about, and this is true like for addiction and some of those kinds of things there, if somebody tells you, well, just don't think about it anymore, what do you do? You think about it more, right? And that's just human nature, right? What Paul understands and what's so brilliant here is, is that he understands, look, to be able to, to change the dynamic or change the pattern of that, that filling your mind with something else is better than 
than beating yourself up or just trying to convince yourself, I shouldn't be worried about that, I shouldn't, shouldn't be thinking about that, or I shouldn't deal with that, that addiction or that thing or that compulsion or whatever it might be, that so often God says to find peace of mind uh, means there's some replacement that is needed for that. And, and he says to fix your, your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then Paul says, just keep putting into practice all these things that, that you've seen in my life. And what Paul has gone through and what God's taught him along the way is so unique. And he says, keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything that you've heard from me and saw me doing, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, our default position so often there is to say, how do we change our circumstances? What Paul says, I want you to change your mind and I want you to change your focus to the one that can actually do something about it. And the fourth is this, and it's a little bit later in this passage, a little bit further beyond verses four through nine, but it fits right in the sweet spot of what he is talking about here today. And the fourth is this, it's to, it's to embrace contentment to embrace contentment. Um, and Paul in verses 12 and 13 says this. He said, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to, to go through highs. I know what it is to go through lows. But he says this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And he said this, go ahead and say it with me, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this through Jesus who gives me strength. And God is saying that to you here today too. He said you can do all things through, through the one through Jesus who gives you strength. Now, the crazy thing is that that phrase, um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, has probably been used on a ton of Christian motivational posters and plaques and things over time. Um, and I'm a pretty optimistic person. I love that idea right there that, man, all things are possible with God. And I do believe that that's true. And I do think that there are moments where God will work in your life and do some things that you couldn't even imagine. But when Paul shares this encouragement to that church in the original context here, the, the primary usage of this is not about success. This is not a slogan on a successories poster or a social media post. It is, it is not primarily about success, it's primarily about contentment. Paul says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And he says, I can, I can do this, I can find peace, I can find hope, I can find confidence, I can experience God working in my life. I can do this in spite of all those things that I've gone through because of the one who gives me peace. Amen? And what I love about Paul is that he helps to encourage and teach towards, man, if you want to experience peace in your life, what he reminds us and the, the very foundation of where he says this can be found is that if you want perfect peace, it is found only in the Prince of Peace. Perfect peace is found only in Jesus, in the Prince of Peace, amen? That, that if you want God's perfect peace, the one that passes all human understanding, that you're not gonna find it in your circumstances, you're not gonna find it in yourself, that, that perfect peace is truly only found in the one who holds your future in ways that you don't. And that name, the Prince of Peace, is given to Jesus is one there to, um, that he has the power to bring peace into this world. 
He has the power to, to make things right. His death on the cross and his resurrection, he has won forgiveness for you. He can make peace between you and God in a way that nothing else can. He can bring about peace in this world. And he's the one, when he comes back one day, there will be perfect peace in this world and in this universe. And as we pray about the Middle East and in places in our world that need the peace of God, there's a spiritual solution that's needed, amen? And, and Isaiah chapter 26, verse three says this, that you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So my challenge for you here today is to take something this week or later on today, take one area of stress in your life, one thing for you where you, you just feel the weight of worry, you feel some stress from your circumstances, something going on in your life. And, and I wanna encourage you to, to walk these steps here with Paul, just to say, all right, how do I give my worries to God as I think about that thing? How do I pray and, and also be thankful for what God is doing in my life. How do I focus on what's positive and how do I ultimately learn contentment as I walk through this? And what I love about him is that Paul reminds us over and over through his writing is that he is not the one who's in control. He said, you wanna have peace and you need to find the one who is in control, amen? So let me pray for you Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are, that you are good and you are working in our lives and that you have the ability to bring peace and confidence and hope separate from our circumstances, Lord, because you are in control. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring your peace, that, that, that our church and that every single person here would find your peace in new ways in their life. Lord, we pray for peace in the Middle East and for you to bring about reconciliation and hope in ways that only you can. We pray that you would bring about peace in families. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring about peace of mind for everyone who needs it here today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.